Hello folks, Dick Fairburn here. I'm going to get back into my series of rifle optics that several people asked me to, uh, to put together. Today I'm going to talk about CQB, Close Quarter Battle Optics. So what we're looking at here is really a no magnification, what we, what we tend to call a 1X type sight. And there are several available. Some of them are available in 2, 3, 4X if you want that. Uh, some of the military units use those kind of things. So if you want to hear about CQB optics, and you want me to tell you why my optic is mounted so far out here, stick around, I'll fill you in. The vast majority of carbine users who are, who are putting these into a self-defense kind of mission. So we're talking an M4, maybe firing a 5.56 five, or a 300 black, whatever kind of cartridge you like. Or a pistol caliber carbine, which are becoming more and more popular all the time. And a couple of companies, including Ruger, has just brought out a 10 millimeter pistol caliber carbine, which I think will be dynamite. Uh, my favorite pistol caliber carbines are actually lever actions because I can get a 357 Magnum or a 44 Magnum. And they gain an, an, an awesome amount of velocity and power over what that cartridge would get from a revolver. The 9mm 40, 45 type pistol caliber carbines don't really gain a lot of power. What you gain is the ability to make hits at 50 to 75 yards very easily, much more easily than you would with a handgun. So pistol caliber carbines are, are you know, they're, they're good for self-defense, whatever you need. Most of these self-defense kind of carbines are going to be used at 100 yards or less. Certainly, they're going to be used at 200 yards or less. The average police patrol rifle shooting, and these numbers are not hard and fast, but of the ones I know of, they rarely exceed 25 or 30 yards. Sometimes they're 25 or 30 feet. So these are generally close-up affairs. So you don't need a lot of magnification to do good work with a carbine. 1X, or essentially no magnification, will do just fine. Okay, I'll answer that question first. This is, a, this is an Aimpoint micro sight. Aimpoint was the first to bring out these optical red dot sights. 1974, they're a Swedish company. Uh, and they were actually invented, so far as I know, for European wild boar shooting. And that's a pretty stylized kind of a hunt. You don't wander through the woods looking for a boar. Instead, the shooters are put on predetermined stands and beaters will walk through the woods and, and you know, make noise and scare the boars ahead of them. And so the shooting for, for these targets is generally a 90 degree cross angle running all out. So this is one of the most difficult kind of rifle shots you can make. And what they learned early on was that aim point with, you know, that really clear optic, that kind of red dot floating in the middle of nowhere and no magnification, was perfect for getting lead on boars that are running by at 50 to maybe 100 yards out. Getting lead you need, getting a hit in the vital and rolling those pigs over. Uh, in fact, if you go to Europe and want to hunt in some of these things, a lot of times you're going to have to show proficiency with your weapon. And the targets they use on a lot of them is, is kind of a double-headed bore, and it runs back and forth at 90 degrees, whatever range they have you set up for. So you need to prove that you can hold the kind of lead you need, get hits in the vitals, and uh, you're adequate to go out on one of those hunts. These sights have no eye relief. Now, typical rifle scopes are going to have the back end of the scope mounted about in here because you've got a, an eye box of about 3 to 4 inches the distance between your eye and that, that rear lens to get full image view. These don't have that problem. You can get full image view here or there and still have that perfectly clear zero magnification image with a red dot floating out there in space. I learned this trick because I had the chance several years ago to go through a weekend class from John Farnham, uh, Defense Tactics International. And John is not, not meaning to insult him at all. He's one of the old generation of 
firearms instructors. He's still active out there. And he is, you call him a FUD if you like, but I, I doubt you will call him a FUD to his face after you've met him much. This guy knows what he's talking about. He is eminently practical. He was one of the first guys to introduce stress into the training, firearms training process. And he's great. He was a, a young Marine lieutenant in Vietnam, and after three Purple Hearts, uh, he got off the front because apparently he was in pretty close to the action. Uh, so he's been there and he's done that. And in that class, there was a guy that had a pro, so Aimpoint Pro. The Aimpoint Pro is about the size of your fist. It's considerably less expensive than these little micros. Very rugged sight. It's what I used, uh, the last police job I had, I was public safety director in a department. They had a hodgepodge of M16A1 loaners from the military, some seizure guns from crimes, and just a hodgepodge of AR-15 style weapons. So before I left, we bought a dozen. We got a good deal from uh, Springfield Armory on their Saint carbine, M4 carbines. We got a dozen of those. We outfitted them with the Aimpoint Pros. Now they had to be mounted here because the optics rail stopped here. This is a Colt ALEC carbine, Advanced Law Enforcement Carbine. So the hand guards are part of the upper receiver. It's all milled as one continuous piece. That allows you to set those optics farther forward. And John was showing someone, he said, well, you got your optic mounted here. And, and that's where I had mine when I got to the class. He said, if you mount it out here, here's what it's gonna change. He said, put that fist right in front of your eye. How much of this peripheral area here is covered up by that optical sight? And he said, now, move your fist out to arm's length and how much of this donut of peripheral vision opened up for you? So you want to mount it as far forward as you can. Now, if this is all the farther you can get, that's fine. We'll, we'll work around that. But if you can get it farther out, it's an advantage for you to do so. Now, I've had people comment on my videos and say, gee, why is your optical sight out that far? And when I explained it to them, they seemed to understand. Of course, there was one guy who still told me I was an idiot because only an idiot would do something like that. Okay, well, I've been told I'm an idiot before and I just kind of consider the source. So mine sits out here as far as I can. Now, I like iron sights on these carbines because if this thing goes dead, batteries out, I have no red dot. What I essentially have is a great big peep sight. And surprisingly, at close range, you can still be pretty accurate with it. But if I have to make a 100-yard shot, or even further, and I don't have a red dot aiming point, or if I slip and fall and this thing gets broken, I can't see through it, then it needs to come off. I put all of my optics on these carbines with quick detach mounts. Now, if you're interested, I use LaRue mounts. I have found them to be absolutely bulletproof. They have an adjustment system to kind of control the torque that tightens them down. They have a nice locking tab. I can very quickly get that optic off. Now I have iron sights. If your carbine does not come with iron sights, and a lot of them don't to save money, lower their retail price, I suggest you get some. Some of the lower priced ones will have the standard M16 style fixed front sight. If, if that doesn't bother you, that's fine. It bothers me. I like a nice clean optical image with nothing in the way. And as I train people, the people I train seem to do better without that front sight in the way. But you can live with it. Uh, it's just a matter of getting used to it. But I like to be able to fold mine down and get them out of the way. But I think you can see the difference. It, you know, if I have this set here, how much of that image is going to be blocked compared to having this here? And we'll see if YouTube throws a fit about me mounting a uh, optic device on a, on a carbine. Snap it in place, lock it down. A good detachable mount, and there are a lot of them out there other than LaRue, probably a lot of them that cost less than LaRue. I'm not sponsored by them. But a good quick detach mount will let you go back to zero each and every time. You can fire a shot, take it off, put it back on, fire another shot, and shoot a group that way. So if they're not giving you that degree of return to zero, then you need a different brand. Okay? So that's why my 1X is mounted out that far. The dots in these range anywhere from one to, I've seen some that are as large as four minutes of angle. Minute of angle equals about one inch at 100 yards. So a one MOA dot is gonna cover up one inch at 100 yards, two inches at 200 yards. That's not a problem at all. 
But if you have a three or even a four MOA red dot and you have to make, for some reason, that 200 yard shot, your threat is a rifle, you're justified in shooting as far as you can, that eight inch dot at 200 yards, which is a four minute of angle dot times two at 200 yards, it's actually gonna cover up the face. Where that one minute dot would only be two inches, I've still got an aiming point in the face. If I have to make, maybe all I've got is a headshot. So a smaller MOA, I think, makes sense. Two is about ideal. You can control the brightness of these, obviously. Um, for example, the, the, the smallest aim points, and, and this there's a new generation of micros after the one I have. There are two. One is a military model, and it has more brightness adjustments on the low end. You can dial it down to where you literally can't see it with the naked eye. And that is for military or police folks using NODs. Night observation devices, they flop, flop down a, a starlight or a thermal device. And then that very, very dim dot is just what they need for that enhanced night vision scope or um, observation devices. If you're not using NODs, you don't need to pay the extra money for the military grade uh, unit. You don't need as many adjustments. If you get them too bright, the dot will appear to be at larger. It, it kind of flares out and gets bigger than it actually is. Another problem with these optical red dot sights is astigmatism. If you have astigmatism, and a lot of people who wear glasses also have astigmatism, that means the cornea, it, it, it's not only misshapen for focus, but it's also not round, not perfectly round. And that outer round will cause these red dots to kind of smear a little bit. You may see the dot and then kind of a smear off to one side or top or bottom. If you dial the brightness down to where it's just nicely visible for the for the time of day, then you don't get that smearing effect. Um, so astigmatism to me is, is, is not a major problem with this, but other types of optics don't give that smear to the red dot or to the reticle when you're um, when you have astigmatism. Uh, battery life on some of these things is, is just unbelievable. If you keep them at a minimum setting, you know, just nicely visible. In, in daytime circumstances, they can they can last for years. Turn them on, leave them on. Uh, as as a cop, the one I carried in my car every six months, I took the battery out and threw it away, and put a new one in. You know, two or three bucks for a battery, every, twice a year. That made sure that it was always going to be working for me. Uh, for M4 style carbines, I like these Magpul pistol grips. They have an insert. There's several, but this insert will hold two. One, two, three batteries, and that's what fuels my white light. I need two batteries for that. It has this reinforcing rib, and I, I kind of filed out a couple of slots. So I'll show you a close-up, so that I can put a couple of these 2032 flat cell batteries on there as well. So I'm carrying two white light batteries, two optics batteries, Magpul. You really ought to change your insert for this and make it more versatile to hold those flat batteries as well. Uh, these optics all have elevation and windage so that you can get them sighted in for where you need. Most of them are generally half MOA adjustments, which is um, plenty good enough. Leupold makes an RDS, a red dot sight. It's a little bit larger than the micro. Uh, the optics are excellent. Every bit is good. I think it's just probably as rugged as an aim point. And they have a version that has a CDS dial. And their custom dial system allows you to adjust that elevation setting once you've zeroed. You can put a, a custom made cap. You send them in your load data, what load you use, velocity from your rifle, things like that. And they will make this dial that on these particular things will probably dial out to four or 500 yards. So if you want to use that 1X and you want to be able to adjust it for long range use, then you might want to look at that loophole RDS. Uh, the custom dial model is like 100 bucks higher, but it, uh, the, the standard model, I think, is the one I would pick. I don't think I would need an RDS on, or a CDS on there. And they're probably about half the price of what you're going to pay for an Aimpoint Mini or Micro like this. Some of these optics have uh, motion sensors so that when they sit stationary, after 5 or 10 minutes, they turn themselves off to save the battery life. That's great because as soon as you pick it up, the light instantly comes on. It's ready when you need it. However, if you're carrying it around in a car, you got to understand that that thing is sensing motion all the time. So it's going to be on all the time. Uh, so that's not necessarily going to be a battery saving feature. 
So with those, you might want to turn it off. And uh, if you're going to pull that rifle out for use, then at some point you've got to touch that button and get that red dot up and, and ready to go. Okay, the second type of 1X optical sight Aim point was the one I used. That, that's the, the, the original for that type site. These are called holographic projection sites. EOTech was the first to bring them out. It still dominates the field in many ways. Uh, military and some police units really like the EOTech. They're a larger optic. They also have infinite eye relief, so you can mount them as far forward as you want and get the bulk of that farther out. One advantage they have is, is they have more than just a central red dot. They can have a custom designed reticle. And that reticle can give you secondary aiming points for 200 yards, 300 yards, windage. It's a more versatile sight in some ways. It, as I understand it, instead of just an LED being projected up onto kind of a mirrored piece of glass, which is how the optic uh, works on the aim point, it's actually a holographic laser projected image on some of the optics in there that gives you that sight. Now, when I was still uh, with the Illinois State Police at our range, the, uh, the three full-time SWAT teams primarily used EOTechs on their M4 carbines. And at that time, some of those first generation EOTechs had a kind of a wandering zero problem. Now these guys were out shooting those rifles all the time. They'd verify their zero at least once a month, maybe a couple times a month. If they needed a slight adjustment, they could make it. But what they found was if those things had been zeroed and then put away for a while and brought back into service, sometimes that zero had changed. Now it's my understanding that uh, EOTech has, you know, long ago fixed that problem. Their zeros are hold pretty well for them and they're very reliable sites. Uh, they, their price range is similar to the aim points. So they're quality optics. And I, I will say with any kind of optical device that you're gonna put on a rifle or, or binoculars or spotting scopes, when it comes to glass, you get what you pay for. There are some brands that, that are really high quality for a pretty darn reasonable price, but you generally get what you pay for. If you buy cheap stuff, you're gonna find that you bought cheap stuff. When aim points were first becoming popular with, with law enforcement, a lot of cops didn't have that kind of money that they would spend on an aim point. There was some stuff on uh, you know, early sales coming in from China or wherever. A lot of the, the one I saw a lot had two different colors of reticles. You could have red or you could have green. What we noticed is if they swapped between red and green reticles, a lot of times their zero changed significantly. So you kind of had to pick one and live with it. That's the sort of thing you see with some of the cheap sites. And, and there are some very cheap red dot sites out there on the market. Go to Amazon and, and you can find them for a little bit of nothing. Some of them might do what you need. You get what you pay for. Okay, does everybody need an EOTech or an Aimpoint? No, not in my opinion. There are Burris sites. There are Bushnell sites. There are Vortex sites. There are SIG, uh, I believe they call theirs a Romeo. There are sites that can do a very good job, much less money than the aim point. Now, under hard conditions, they may not hold up. Their optics may not quite be as good. Their, their battery life may not be quite as long. So those are the things that you're paying for with top drawer equipment. We're seeing a lot of holographic style sites out for pistols now. They're smaller than the EOTech. Um, everybody has them, Loophole, Hollow Sun, uh, I'm going to miss a lot of them here, so I'm not even going to try. SIG has some, I believe. Those can do a good job on, on a rifle, just as good a job as they can on a handgun. They're smaller, they're going to give you more peripheral vision, and some of them are less money. Going to do you a perfectly good job. A lot of those are just going to have a dot. If you want a more complicated reticle, then you have to look around and see what's available. Now, I'll show you, for the sake of argument, one other... This is a traditional optical red dot sight made for a pistol. This is the Leupold Delta Point Micro. It's really one of the smallest red dot sights you can get your hands on. 
kind of odd looking. They are made to fit either Glock or Smith & Wesson pistols. They fit in the rear sight dovetail. So if you think you're going to mount an optic on there and have the high suppressor height sights that co-witness with your dot, uh, that it ain't going to work with this. You will get some degree of co-witness with the front sight, but you don't have a rear sight to throw into that mix. I don't get along with the suppressor height sights and a red dot on the pistol. I've tried them, and I don't like them. This is a Glock 48. So I've got this micro sight. I took the front sight off for that slick, clean image I like on a carbine. And the more I use this, the more I like it. It's a pretty small dot, and it's a pretty small tube. So it takes a little getting used to. And when you got about 10 million repetitions on a 1911 like I do, and the Glock has just slightly a different grip angle, it's a retrain to get that red dot to pop where I want it every single time. But I'm getting there and uh, this might become a pretty substantial carry gun for me before it's over. I, there's probably a way to get these mounted on a rifle, but they're gonna have to be up so high because of this battery box. And they're so small, it's a, it's a hard tube to find. Uh, the ones made for rifles are much better, in my opinion. But I just, I wanted to say, show you that there is a really small micro optical red dot sight. So we got the opticals like the aim point. We've got the holographical projection. And I'll show you photo, you know, images of these because I don't have one to show you. There are a couple of other CQB to mid-range sights that are being used by military units. The, it, civilians can get their hands on them, and if you want them, they're great. Uh, they're they're a prism sight actually, uh, they, which means instead of looking directly through the optics, the light path through the optics gets folded through a prism. What you're really looking at, if you remember the old style binoculars, that the eyepieces were here, but the, you know, the objective lenses were wider out. That's how the prism worked. But now most of the binoculars we have are straight tubes, straight through. That Poro prism system in there that, that folds the light but gives you the optical length you need for magnification, that's built into the ACOGs and the LCANs. And these are two that we see on military weapons. Uh, ACOGs are very popular with the Marine Corps. I think most all Marine warfighters are running ACOGs on their, their carbines now. Uh, the LCAN is used, in my limited experience with them, it's used primarily on crew served weapons like machine guns. But it can work on rifles as well. Because of the prism, because of the optics design that's in there, these are pretty expensive scopes. Um, ACOGs, LCANs, uh, they're often in excess of $2,000 for the optics. Now these are mil-spec optics, they're rugged. Uh, the Trigicons have both uh, tritium, radioactive lighting for the dot, as well as fiber optics for daytime use. The LCANs, I believe, are all battery powered. Because of the way the prisms work, these things can be more than one power. We can get them in one and a half, you can get them in two. The ACOG, a lot of the ACOGs have a, a lever so that you can flip them from one to four power or one and a half to six power. So you can boost that thing up to uh, give you a better long range potential with that carbine. So from a military point of view, I think they're outstanding. They're heavy, they're expensive, and when you get up to four or more power, they get to be pretty good size. Uh, quite a bit larger than, than something like an Aimpoint Micro. So the Elcans and the ACOGs are out there. They're, there is nothing wrong with them at all. They're, as I said, they have good points and bad, uh, but they are pretty expensive stuff. Now many of these optics, you can get an auxiliary magnifier that goes behind. Uh, they make them for the um, EOTEX, they make them for the Aimpoint style red dot sights. They generally have a pivot, so you can pivot them out of the way. You can bring them up in the line of optics and magnify both your image and your dot. Most of them are around three power. Uh, that's another piece of optics. That's another expensive thing that you have to get on there, get lined up, get focused in. Uh, but it does give you kind of like that ACOG with that one to four or one and a half to six optical switch. So that can boost the versatility of your 1X no magnification sights. So to kind of sum this up, 
these these red dot EOTech Elcan ACOG type sites I think will cover the vast majority of what most people need for a one to two hundred yard carving. If you need more than that then you might need to go to a low power variable optic. This is a loophole VX6 it's a one to six power it has an illuminated red dot reticle in the center so if I dial this down to one power and I light up that optic, uh, that, that lighted reticle, I've essentially got a 1x red dot scope and I can use it for CQB. The disadvantage is I've got an eye box. So I've got to have that optic within three to four inches of my eye to get the full field of view. Whereas with my aim point, I can put it anywhere. They're heavier, but they're more versatile. This is what, this is the kind of scope used by most military designated marksmen. Often a rifle squad now will have a designated marksman with an optic like this. And a lot of times they're going from one to eight or maybe even one to 10. And what they're finding is that designated marksman in, in the army, they were primarily using five, five, sixes. The Marines were using some uh, brought out of mothballs M14s with the, these kind of optics on there. Uh, I believe they're all going to a variation of the M110 kind of sniper system. There's one dedicated as a sniper rifle, one that's a little simpler and lighter that's, that's a designated marksman. They're finding in the realistic fights in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and places like that, a lot of times of that rifle squad that's out there, half or more of the hits will be scored by that one designated marksman. So it's a very powerful concept. Uh, for war fighters, for infantry fighters, and, and they're going to scopes like this. I'm going to talk about variable optics next, both the low power, say 1 to 6, 3 to 9, 6 to 18, 5 to 25, whatever you think you need. Hopefully this has given you some good information about CQB kind of optics, and if I've missed something, if you have questions, by all means, put them in the comments. I'll try to answer as many as I can. A lot of my early videos, I showed my second book that I wrote, Building a Better Gunfighter. And at the time, I had a couple hundred copies of that thing left from when Pallet and Press closed down. And those have been gone for a number of months now. Uh, I appreciate you folks buying them the way you have. I've had a number of people contact me and say, hey, is your book still available? And the answer for a while was no. But the answer now is yes. Building a Better Gunfighter is on Amazon.com as a Kindle book. And hopefully within a week or so, you will also be able to order a paperback from them if, if that's what you would rather have. Uh, the Kindle is $9.95. Not sure what the uh, paperback will be. But if you're interested in my, in my book, go to Amazon.com, put in the search line, Building a Better Gunfighter and it will pop up. Now you gotta look just a little bit because there's an old, it says used paperback copy available from someone. They want over $2,900 for it. <laughs> I wish I could have sold mine for that price. But if you look a little further, you can click on Kindle and you'll find it for $9.95 as an ebook. And as I said, paperbacks will be available soon. So if anyone is interested in this book, it's up on Amazon.com now. Folks, I appreciate you watching these videos. My, my viewership is going up. My, my um, subscriptions are going up. And I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be able to sit here and talk to people and have you listen. And uh, if you think it's worthwhile, please subscribe or resubscribe as necessary. Uh, give me a thumbs up. Stay safe out there, ladies and gentlemen. This is early October. The danger, most dangerous part, I think, of our next few months is between now and the election and then from the election on. Um, I did a little separate video about vote. Please go vote. If you're not registered, go register. I think this is the most important election in my lifetime, certainly, maybe in the lifetime of our country. So be safe out there. Be prepared. We don't know what's going to happen. Thank you for watching. Okay, we got them both here now. You ready? got one. Ginger got one. Uh-huh. Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl, last one. Ready? You ready? 
Yeah. That's all there is till next time.